Welcome back to part two of The Intrepid Hunter. We're talking to Nathan Little about his adventures hunting ibex in Kyrgyzstan. When he got to that kind of base camp one, what um, what kind of altitude were you at then? We went up to, I think, 3,000, three and a half, call it about three and a half thousand metres. Then we dropped down, and I think base camp for us was about 2,800 metres. Okay. Um, um, off, off, off the top of my head, yeah. Were, were you prepared for that? I mean, in terms of the kit that you'd taken, had you had to invest in special clothing or...? Yeah, in the, in the run-up to it, I tried quite a, quite a lot of different kit. When you do things like that, I mean, I've got loads of kit at home, and you think, well, could I take that, could I take that? And then you realise, actually, when you're in the temperatures that we were told to expect, you realise that the kit that you've got is not necessarily cut out for that. And what we found was, uh, well, I, I tried a few different bits out. I ended up with um, some of the Ventile stuff, which is the material is Ventile, which um, they used for, uh, is it Randolph Fiennes, the adventurer? And Edmund Hillary used it on um, Everest. So it's got some history to it. And Randolph Fiennes used it. Used this material in the Antarctic. It's all natural. And Laxon, uh, the Danish company, produced some stuff. So they did, they've got a smock. I, I, I ended up getting a, a smock and the new pants for it, well, as well as some different fleeces and things like that, which were designed for more severe weather, cold, colder climbs, and something a little bit more hard wearing, given that we're on rock most of the time. And I have to say, without without fear of contradiction it is the the best kit i've ever had it's phenomenal uh, we were in some temperatures which i'll come to in a bit which were just absolutely baltic conditions and you'd never know it was amazing no i didn't sweat it was important not to sweat um because of the temperatures particularly at night and yeah it was just absolutely bomb proof that's a really good testament to the kit because i guess when you get out there, it's not like you can go to the shop and replace well, well, anything. Well, exactly. When, when, when we were in base camp, we were three hours from the nearest village, and that's three hours by car. So, yeah, it, it was it was quite quite a way. So you need to have confidence in, in, in the kit that you've got. And I tried it before I went, loved it, packed up a few other bits and pieces. I ended up taking from possum merino socks. <laughs> My I've God, they're brilliant. Thing. They're amazing. They're, br- they're amazing. <laughs> uh, absolutely amazing. So, yeah, all kit was sort of pre-planned in advance because we were there for 10, 10 days. Um, and medical, we took med- we, we took plenty of different medications, um, the f- good old wet wipes, plenty of those were packed. <laughs> and I was told, um, I ended up going by, going buying some joggers and people were recommending because because we were going to be riding horses quite a lot, quite extensively over the over the course of the next certainly the next few days. We I was told to buy some joggers because of saddle sore, and I'd never had saddle sore before. And I was assured by plenty of friends who ride that it's one of the most unpleasant things. And somebody suggested, well, I'm looking at them all and saying hundred quid there, I'm like crikey, you know, it's, you know, whatever. But it then somebody said to me, go to Decathlon and they've got some for seventeen quid. Well, I bought them, took a risk. They're they're amazing. So comfortable. <laughs> really, really comfortable. Uh, you know, a, a, a extra extra cushion, let's just say. Um, <laughs> not all the kit has to be super expensive. You just have to get the get kit that is made for made for a purpose. And you can find kit that's not necessarily it's not necessarily just a, a brand you're paying for, but if you've got the kit that's made from the right material and made well, you know, there, there is there is stuff out there. But I have to say, testament to Laxon, it's mega. You mentioned a second ago about the, um, you took out some medical kit, kit with you. Um, did you have medical insurance? What was your kind of plan if, you know, someone fell off a horse and needed emergency evacuation or were you not really thinking about that? I'll be honest, the naivety of me on the first trip was not really thinking about it. Thankfully, my insurance with my with my bank, um, I had medical insurance um to an extent there it was foolish of me it was a bit of a silly move not to it was just a huge oversight but you're so excited about kit and everything else like that and you don't think the worst worst is going to happen which is a silly thing to do but it's an honest answer in the sense that 
it, you know, you look at it and go, oh, yeah, I'll be, all, I'll be all right. I had medical insurance with my bank. Yeah, it was, it was, for, you know, you, it, medical insurance isn't that expensive. I don't, I don't think for, for, for even for trips like that, but it's worth it. It's, it's absolutely vitally important. And I now say that with absolute conviction, knowing now what I, what I was about to experience the following day, following two days, three days, and so on and so forth. Um, so medical insurance is a must. Okay, so now now I'm really intrigued. What? <laughs> so you get there, it's seven o'clock at night. Do they feed you? Where are you sleeping? We actually had a really quite plush uh, accommodation. It was like a little cabin. The heating was... Uh, the, sorry, the heating was on, but the electricity was rationed. Bearing in mind, we're so far away from everywhere. So you had a generator and it'd go off at certain times. But, you know, we had we had carpets, we had a flushing toilet. <laughs> we had cushioned toilet roll. <laughs> and uh, we had bedding on there, which <laughs> I thought, oh, Greg, it looks mink. It looks like mink. No, it wasn't. It was just, it was just that sort of really furry... Um, <laughs> furry sort of material that when you learn you get huge static shocks <laughs> um but it was just nice to get into a bed we had uh, we had dinner that night and we had the most amazing little canteen and there was a lady who lived on site she for, for hunting parties who was just amazing so lovely the food was fantastic but she she sort of helped us to sort of experiment with trying new things most people don't particularly when it comes to food don't particularly want to step out of their comfort zone if they're so far away from society and civilization and things like that they'd like some sort of comfort but it was just lovely the food we had stews we had like sort of um borscht i think which, which is like the Rus- russian cabbage and beetroot which was amazing uh we'd have things like beef beef stews and and a few and a, a variety of other dishes over the course of the trip. Breakfast was lovely. It, could, it was sort of like um, uh, omelets and cooked meats and things like that. And again, a lot of tea, a lot of tea. So that was the food was great. So we ate that night, went to bed, and you're just absolutely knackered. So you just don't really care about anything else. You're there, everything's there, all your kits there. Let's go hunting. The next morning was absolutely glorious. We went and zeroed the rifles. We met the guide. So we met the government official who was guiding, who was supervising the hunt. And then our two guides who were taking us out, who were, were just Beck and Bismar. Um, and they were just fantastic. Um, and Cabal was our hunting a, um, supervisor, who was just a legend. So we zeroed the rifles and we spent that day acclimatizing. So set this up and so say, before I left, I'd spoke to friends of mine who had done this hunt before and they said to me, you will get there. You will be asleep at night or you'll lie there at night and you will go. And I'm going to say, excuse my French. What the fuck am I doing here? (laughs) Why am I here? And get me home. Yes, that is exactly what was going through my head. (laughs) It was nuts. And that was mainly at night. Because you lie there and you think you think of all the you think of how remote you are, you can't communicate with anybody, you don't know how everything is at home. And for me, who is sort of social media obsessed because it's part of my job and I'm quite social and, and talkative, it was it was sort of like you you've you've stitched my mouth shut, you've cut my hand, hands and arms off, and I can't sort of communicate or do anything. And it was quite scary, absolutely, you know, in the first couple of nights there. And you're trying to, you're there to acclimatise. So obviously your breath is a bit, you're a bit short of breath anyway. But during the day, it's amazing because you're there, you see this incredible scenery, which in initial, in initial look, it look, look, just looks barren and mountainous. But actually, when you look at it more, it's, it's, it's stunning. The topography, the rivers and understanding what everything is and, and where it, where everything is and what animals are, you see. So after sort of the day of acclimatization and getting used to everybody, they went us out, they took us out on the horses for the first time to get familiar with everything. And at that point you settled in, everything's happy. And I thought, right, let's go for it. Following day, we went out, we all packed up and we went on our first actual hunt. So you don't hunt technically until sort of day three. We set out 
hunting um and we then got on the horses packed our bags and at a fly camp overnight so we, we took, took tents and everything and the and there was five of us went out so the three guides well two guides the official and um dimitri and i it was in four hours on horseback <laughs> across some of the well I, I haven't ridden a horse in years and I was actually quite comfortable because of the jog and everything like that. But I hadn't ridden in years. And all of a sudden, I'm going down drops that were just ridiculous. <laughs> um, with There was at one point, and I've got a video of it somewhere, of what was best part of a 150, 200-foot sheer drop. And the track was about 12 inches wide. Oh. It was petrifying. And I'm filmed, but I'm still managing to film it because all it in your decathlon you know, jog purse. Yeah, all in the decathlon jog purse. And um, we're going through there. But at the same time, you're seeing eagles everywhere. You're seeing all manner of sort of vultures and other other birds of prey and things like that. You're seeing ibex right up on cliffs and they're climbing on things that are sort of sheer walls. But they've obviously, you know, they can just climb up these, you know, sort of impossible sort of uh, rock face. And there's, ibex everywhere but they spot you a mile off and they're off and and it's just a case of spotting and stopping and looking at the right spaces you know you're coming in through areas of covered in snow and you realize as you look over to your either your left or your right alongside the horse hoof prints you've got wolf prints and snow leopard prints and you just think this is just absolutely incredible it's amazing and we didn't get to see any of them but just the fact that you've seen the footprints you know they're there it was it was it was awesome you know we'd spend that whole day hunting and glassing the different valley you know valleys and different tops and going the horses were just incredible and you'd go up one hill come down and go up and i think at one point we're nearly sort of four thousand meters up we had lunch about three thousand eight hundred meters which was just amazing and we ended up eating um some marco polo which is like a wild sheep uh that was shot a couple of weeks before and they butchered it up and they cooked, cooked lunch there on the hilltop for us, more tea. <laughs> and, uh, you, you know, and at that point, at that height, it was crystal clear. So it became quite warm. So you then having to take your layers off because obviously you start to sweat. And then if you, when you're not doing anything, it freezes. Oh, you run the risk of it freezing. And that was sort of the day three on the afternoon and was for me the most petrifying days because actually what happened was we went up where we'd glassed um some ibex on the hill about two hours before and we saw them uh there must have been about 150 200 in this group so we they wanted us to come right the way around so it took about two hours to get around the back of them so the plan was to shoot over the hill that as in often the case they'd moved on and he says well beck who was our lead guide said right nath you're going to go down with Bismar, uh, who was the other guide, and shoot it around this corner. So jump off the horse, load up, take your gun, and <laughs> we'll meet you later on. We'll take the horse. And I'm and I'm not clicked, I'm not registered at this point what is <laughs> go, gonna happen. They go off on the horses, uh, and I thought, well, I'm just gonna go around this corner and there's a group there and I'll shoot my eye back. Four hours later. I am still shimmying down this mountain by hand. You had to be there to see it, but I nearly fell a number of times. There was about, there was one part, and, and, and word of advice to anybody doing this who's never done it before, make sure you have a sling with your rifle. I didn't. So it was being carried by hand all the way down. Oh my goodness. And I'm l- lowering myself down um you're on razor sharp rocks because it's sort of been a road over the years by wind and and sort of little bits of sand or or, or dust it it was crazy the leather gloves that i had on were just cut to ribbons and it took me about four it took us about four hours to get down because whilst we started halfway up the mountain the other guys on the horses were going right the way around it took them nearly three hours four hours to get there to meet us and we're lowering ourselves down glassing now, my guide is in fits of laughter watching this hopelessly useless gang- gangly Englishman trying to shimmy down what he sort of hop, skipped and jumped down. And he's there smoking his camel cigarettes <laughs> and just laughing at me. And I'm genuinely petrified. 
and he he just runs across this at one point he runs across this shale slope and it's all loose shale and the drop is a it, it was a good 300 feet from the top to the bottom and i ran and it started to give way because i was much heavier than he was and he's just laughing as i'm falling down this thing and i'm thinking you're finding this hilarious i'm really not and i'm about to die and i'm nearly crying at this point <laughs> <laughs> And I'm not afraid to say it. And I end up throwing myself at him and he grabs my hand and pulls me up. And then you sort of gather your thoughts for a few moments, you know, have a bit of a breather. And then you look back at where you've just climbed and you go, holy shit, that's that's not fun. But then... So you didn't have to go back? The, you, I no, mean, you... thank, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking well, you still had to come down and then up and down because you're navigating some of these drops that you can't even, even go through. And there's all these sort of prickly like thorns that are sort of grown like weeds. I'm thinking, if we go back, I ain't going back. I that, that That's not happening <laughs> for sure. And then we get to this ledge and we see these ibex in the distance. And he says, can you take a shot? And I ranged it. And he said, it's only 600 metres. So I went, not a chance. Not a chance. I ain't coming all this way to take a shot at something that I'm not, I've not shot anywhere near that distance and, and, to, and to fuck it up. And he was absolutely perfect it was no problem at all but for them to think <laughs> i must have given off a vibe that i really knew what i was doing <laughs> um <laughs> but it was good it was good to be there for about an hour just watching these ibex hoping that they may come closer or, or or come down or we can position ourselves needless to say that was sort of the first day hunting we still had to get best part of 150 foot down further and at this point the 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 rest of the guys had met us at or would, would already sort of got to the bottom of the mountain and started setting up camp for the night, which was a bit more reassuring to, to know that they were there, we could see them. But it was still, uh, you know, tricky on the old legs to get back down this, because the further down you get, the more loose the ground gets, something like that. So we got to camp that night. We had lunch there, and we had a real, real laugh. And it was in this beautiful valley, and, and it, it got dark quite quickly. And we have had dinner, and we're sort of having a bit of a chat and plan of action for the following morning knowing that the ibex go from what, what they told us they go up to the top at night and then they come down into the valley to feed the following day so it was planned for an early start so at this point we've got our little tent <laughs> dimitri and i are um trying to squeeze ourselves into this what should have been a one person tent at least <laughs> and you, you know or, or half a person if that and we're trying to squeeze ourselves into there and I think I fell asleep in between two rocks, or say fell asleep. It was on hard ground. It was it, it was just a nightmare. But I was warm at night again because the kit was fantastic. I wasn't I wasn't don't get me wrong. I wasn't toasty, but I was sufficiently comfortable that I could get some sleep. And you knew it was bad because even in the tent, the bottle, the, you know, the following morning, the the water had all frozen. And we think we think we got to about minus fifty, minus twenty. We had to bring um a different type of sleeping bag sort of minus 30 plus sort of condition uh, sleeping bag and kit there and, and ground mats and i think that that's obviously helped hugely if we'd have gone for a cheap sleeping tent it wouldn't have been it'd have been quite dangerous potentially so we got about an hour's sleep between us <laughs> that night and the rest of the time either dimitri was snoring or i was <laughs> um <laughs> so waking each other up we got up about five in the morning which was about the crack of, you know, the crack of door. And from there, the, I could hear them all chatting. Dimitri had got up and dressed outside. I was just like, can I have a lie in? <laughs> and they tell me, the, 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 the chatting away, and I'm talk, hearing them talking about Ibex and things. And at this point, they're saying, right, we're going to go. There's an Ibex, or there's a couple of Ibex up there. So I'm packing my kit and bursting for the loo. <laughs> and so... I uh, quickly sort everything out and they're like, no, no, bring your gun, we're going. So we end up stalking up this riverbank for about 200 yards. For, yeah, for about 200 yards, to, to about 200 metres up past, past the, the, the camp. And we pop up and where we pop up, it was as if it was sort of all staged. It definitely wasn't, but there's was a perfect sort of resting spot for me to sort of collect everything, you know, collect all my thoughts together, get everything ready and, and, and glass this Ibex, which had come down. I'm thinking, right, okay, perfect. So we ranged it in, 250 metres, we're watching, first shot, and drops, drops on the spot. 
And I'm thinking, happy days, you know, after yesterday's debacle of the most horrendous conditions I've ever experienced, it, you know, I was sort of rewarded with my eyebags. Well, they're all cheering and chanting. And next minute, this thing gets back up. And, I'm, and I've never, I've never experienced something get up again after it's been shot and it transpired it was 250 meters it transpired it was well it was about it was 200 meters when i shot it first and the shot had gone slightly high from what i'd what we'd calculated on the when we'd been practicing and it just must have just nicked the top and it got up and started walking on so it, it was a very much a case of quick second shot at 200 or 250 meters and thankfully we dropped him this time but at that point, you sort of keep an eye on it, let everything settle down around you, and then make a plan to go up and get it. And at that point, you realise, even with the binoculars, you can't see these things once it's once it's down. The camouflage in them is amazing. And you realise then how well adapted they are to that, that sort of environment. Anyway, we get up there, and it's difficult, even though it's 250 metres, which over here is nothing, the the strain on you for walking up somewhere like that because of the altitude is is bizarre. So it took us sort of half an hour. It took me half an hour to get there. <laughs> you could see the animal then, and they're, they're just absolutely spectacular. They're more dense than a than a red a big red stag. I mean, it was huge, even though it was a, it was a short stumpy thing, but it was very very dense. What ammunition did you use? I had the let me think. Thing. It was the I had some gecko. 165 grain ammunition which we tried out i was going to take up i have been trying out the um how do some people write it different cell and cell and belly um lead free and that 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 was doing really well that that done really well but it didn't i didn't need to to take lead free and people have said look if you if you can use lead use lead because obviously it expands better and I, and again i'm i'm in no authority and i'm in no position to advise anybody on ammunition i'm actually the one that takes advice off people who, who who know far more than me but i found that the gecko stuff was really good i'm going to use this i'm going to use the cell and uh, cell and bellet um stuff that i've got over here because obviously it's non-toxic and the, the whole non-toxic thing's been discussed now but the gecko stuff was 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 fantastic it did the job it it didn't it didn't go straight through, but it expanded for fully. And um, we had later found the found the bullet. Actually, I've got it here. Uh, the, um, I've got the expanded ammo here that we pulled out. We then dragged it, and I wanted to do everything physically possible. I didn't want to leave it to somebody else to do. I'm not in that. I'm not. I wasn't interested in that. And again, that's a part of the reason why I'm doing these trips is because I actually want to do, I, I, I want to throw myself in and get more, st get stuck in and learn from people who've done it a lot more, a lot more than me, but I want to still participate. And I'm not there to just pull the trigger and go because it's, that's the tiniest fraction of the whole trip. So Dimitri and I then drag this Ibex off the hill back to base camp hand the guides our cameras to make it look like we were doing all the work and they're filming <laughs> us and they were just brilliant the guys there were mega you know they you know they, they loved getting in on the on the photos and and showing us and chatting with us and you know we're learning we, we you know we were getting them to teach us um some kyrgyz and russian and chit chat with them like that and, and they're shouting things at us and having a, having a laugh as we're dragging this what essentially was probably about 100 kilos it was it was it was heavy down to down to base camp and we got there had some breakfast and then the guys go to work skinning and preparing it and i wanted to film at this point i helped them but i wanted to film and and document everything and what, what was most endearing to me was knowing that everything on that animal was going to be taken. You know, yes, I've got the cape coming back as a, as a sort of memento of what the trip was, something I can look back in years' time. On. But seeing them to butcher an animal in a way that is not conventional to how I've seen it done over here, they don't, they don't value prime cuts like the fillets or, or anything like that. Everything's eaten, but they, they they cut it in a very different way because it's food. They're not there to present it nicely on a on a plate. It eats well. Happy days. How do they so preserve th it from there? The cold, the the shit, the, the cold temperatures. It was probably it was colder than most people's. Well, colder than the fridge. 
So it gets what happens is is they break the animal up, put it in bin bags, and then it goes into these satchels on the side of the horses, and and it's just there for the next day or two because the temperature temperatures aren't going to exceed anything above zero. So you're absolutely fine. And it was nice to see that everything was everything was taken. I mean, obviously the they don't take all the uh, the internals. They take the um, the heart and the the liver and the kidneys, but which is like the same over here. But it was just nice that nothing's wasted and everything is going to go to use somehow. So then they mounted. Oh, you know, we'd done that. We'd been done. We were done then by nine o'clock in the morning, and we were off then to go and get Dimitri's. And you just sort of feel like in some sort of western, you know, coming down like a cowboy coming down off these hills. You know, you've got a an ibex on on the on the, on the back of the horse, and you sort of got everyone's carrying guns. It was ace. I just I loved it, and you could film, and the weather was was spectacular, and I could get the drone out and have some you know some nice sort of aerial footage there, and it was just a really pleasant, easy morning after the after the previous day, and at that point, we're then heading back towards camp, ready to go and get Dimitri's. Did you feel like you did um, enough? physical training you mentioned earlier that you did swimming in preparation do you wish you'd done a bit more with hindsight always do more oh yeah always always do more I felt more than comfortable I think being honest adrenaline and excitement got me got me through it and by, by the time I got back to camp and at night I was absolutely you know goosed you know I'm going to go back would I do more for them 100% but because you're on a horse you don't feel necessarily the strain of the thin air because the horse is doing most of the work. So to say you have to be super, super fit to do it would be, a you know, sort of not necessarily an untruth, but, you know, not necessarily essential. But you don't go somewhere like that intentionally unfit, let's just put it that way, because of the risks, because you are so remote. I mean, I'm thinking we, we, we came down from sort of 4,000 metres uh, when Dimitri went and got his, uh, we were Cabal, the uh, government official, and I stayed at the top, <laughs> sort of just thinking that there were going to be a, an hour. Well, they were there for nearly three hours, four hours, and we were on the very top of these peaks in Baltic conditions, waiting. At this point, you can't go down on a horse because it's too steep. So we had to walk the horses down. And that was just horrendously scary because you've got five horses all in sort of tandem on uh, on a sort of lead rope. It, it gets to a point where he, he he's so funny because he's obviously does it all the time. And he comes and grabs the one horse that I was supposed to be leading and grabs it and takes it from me and goes, I'll do it. You, <laughs> you know, you know, Englishman, you walk down, you know, you, you don't know what you're doing. And it was it was very true. I didn't know what I was doing. And I'm so glad he did. But walking down there, that took everything takes hours. And by this time, it was getting at six o'clock at night. Dimitri had shot his. We were then in pitch black as we were going back. And we had nothing but an iPhone torch to get us from these from this mountain top, well, from this mountain along the riverbed. And you're thinking, I, I hope to God this horse has had its carrots and can see in the dark because I can't see, I can't see shit. <laughs> How are the guides navigating? Is it just they tread trodden that path so frequently? know it I, i'm assuming that that's what it that's what it is they just know what they're doing that yeah i ended up when we got we dumped a load of our kit like tents and everything by the river with the intention of coming back if we didn't get dimitri's ibex so by the time we got back it was pitch black anyway and we'd done this i mean i was i was literally shaking with fear at some of the stuff that we did on horseback and part of the ride where I said it was about 150, 200 foot drop. We did that in pitch black. So it, it was nuts. And we got to the river, uh, river and I'd had my head torch there from the night before. So I give it to the lead guide and we had a bit more light than an iPhone torch. But when you get on that home straight after four hours in pitch black, coming back to base camp, because we thought, bugger it, we'll just go straight back to base camp that night. And you've got four hours of that and you've got on the home straight where it's flat ground or, or flatter ground. And you can see the base camp sort of uh, floodlight in the distance, but doesn't seem to be getting any closer. You, but you know you're heading in the right direction. That's that's a, a huge sigh of relief. And needless to say, I think we got back about 10 o'clock that night, had a bite to eat and then went straight to bed, ready for the next morning of just sort of decompressing getting everything sorted because we both got our ibex at this point 
that was the that was the point I could I could manage to call home because I really wanted to call home and check in on everybody. And we had a sat a sat phone. We didn't take a sat phone with us into the hills. And I was thinking, I'm panicking, like cautious Carol here. That's what I was. And I'm thinking, if somebody falls off, I haven't got a sat phone. So next time I'm buying my own sat phone. <laughs> but managed to sort of get gather our thoughts. And it was at that point I'm thinking, I've got a we're, we're day five in at this point and I'm laying there thinking I really need to get home now I loved it but I'm uh, I'm I'm tired I, I'm a bit disorientated I haven't had a proper shower I haven't had a shower in, fu- in four days because there wasn't where you could just sort of splash water on your face and again good old wet wipes but <laughs> it was you start to sort of your mind or my mind started to play tricks on me a little bit and you start panicking and stressing and you try and distract yourself, and that's why it was good in the day. But then I started to realise why friends said to me, you will lie there now and you'll think, why the fuck am I here? And I did it in the tent the night before, where, you know, the game in the middle of nowhere. And it's strange because you realise you're so far away from everywhere and so remote and so out of contact with anybody. But when you're having dinner in the pitch black at sort of eight, nine o'clock at night, in the in the middle of these valleys and you look up and you see a plane going over 30 odd thousand feet up you think it's really really strange bizarre anyway morning comes we had um had a bit of time to ourselves and we had a celebratory dinner that night which was just so special because the guides brought the guitar out and started singing some of their sort of traditional songs and having a real laugh copious amounts of vodka was drunk that night (laughs) And I mean, copious amounts. Um, I think we ended up doing certainly four litres. Oh, my goodness. Between sort of, uh, well, there wasn't that many. I'm not going to say how many. There wasn't that many, put it that way. I don't remember going to bed. And I think the the discussion was was sort of hinted at in a drunken state. Should we go wolf hunting that night <laughs> on horses? Thankfully, None of us were in a fit state to go wolf hunting. <laughs> and it was just amazing. We had a, the lady who did all the cooking for us came and had dinner with us. The guide, uh, all the three guides did, and we were winding each other up. And because at this point we'd become friends, we'd shared experiences with one another. We were having, you know, having such a laugh out hunting and winding each other up and sort of reminiscing on some of the things that had happened just a couple of, you know, over the last couple of days. It was just, so special and i've and thankfully despite how drunk i was i managed to get loads of videos and photos of us all together ready for printing out into my scrapbook and i've started scrapbooking now like like some sort of uh, <laughs> sort of crazy crazy spinster that's just sat there <laughs> scrapbooking i love it and that was that was particularly special we actually ate some of the ibex that we'd shot dimitri what does it thought, taste like dimitri thought it was rancid i loved it it was just incredible it It was like very very strong lamb really strong lamb and how she cooked it it was quite it it had quite tough it was quite tough but i thought it was absolutely delicious and we had it with sort of i think we had it with sort of like a stewy type in a stewy type thing maybe with some rice can't remember can't remember and some sort of um peppers and Bake, you know, baked peppers and things like that. And I thought it was absolutely delicious. Whether or not that was because I was absolutely ravenous <laughs> or um, I genuinely thought it was nice, but I'd eat it again. And the Marco Polo was really nice. That was, again, another another sheep. So, yeah, that was great. The next morning, woke up still very drunk to sort of a rap on the door from our main guide who walked in with another bottle of Russian standard vodka at nine o'clock in the morning. I've always maintained that if somebody asks you for a drink, you don't say no, it's bad manners. So I'm out at this point. Dimitri can't even look at the bottle. And I go out, I, I get get changed, get dressed, and I go and sit outside of them at nine o'clock in the morning. We're doing a bottle of um, vodka. And I think we polished that bottle off just after breakfast. <laughs> Oh my goodness! We weren't hunting or anything else at that point. Everything was no. packed away, packed away, and ready to go. Um, I got them all to do because I because I smoke cigars. I think a lot of people know me for for cigar smoking. I got them all on the cigars with me, which was you know it's become a sort of funny thing. Every tra- every time I do a trip, I get cigars out, and they've got to have a cigar with me, or at least pose with one, even if they don't smoke. 
so we got a, I got a lovely photo of that. Yeah, it was it was then starting to pa- to pack up. Then sort of day six, day seven. But, but yeah, but day, but day six, we'd gone back. To, you know, started the 10, 10 hour drive back to Bishkek because we needed at this point a few days back in the city to deal with the skins that we were going to take back or how to manage them, have them done, have the veterinary paperwork done with them. And our guide needed to have all the expert permits and everything done for that as well. So at that point, we'd gone back to Bishkek and she got us into a a lovely hotel to have dressing gowns on the wall with slippers and <laughs> a nice hot shower and a pool and a, a restaurant was just the the bit of luxury that we needed after I wouldn't say slumming it because we saw one of the other agents camps as we were coming back and we were like thank god we had an indoor toilet thank god we had a log cabin and xyz because there was just a hole in the ground for the toilet again oh and god. um uh, an old container converted into bedrooms so it's like yeah we picked the right one how do you know though I mean when you look at all the marketing materials for these outfitters how did you choose the one you chose and not make the mistake that probably lots of people do and just pick well I think I think, the toilet? <laughs> I think the the saving grace was having somebody like Dimitri there because whilst me being me I think, oh, yeah, I don't want to sort of impose and don't want to ask too many questions and think, being too overly polite. He's a bit more blunt than I am. And he's going, right, uh, we want pictures of this, this, this and this. You know, where, where do we do this? And asking questions that he knows to ask from his previous experience. And I think it's always good if you're never going to, if you've never been abroad, go with somebody, either preferably I would go with somebody who, who hunts abroad a bit or has hunted abroad before, and then they've got an idea on what to expect and they can sort of handhold you. Because I, I needed my handholding a lot of that time in the run up to that trip. And going there was, um, you, you know, was was the first step to do, you know, to, to sort of being now able to advise people and help people there was, you know, was important. So go with somebody, ideally, if you can go with somebody who has hunted abroad before, if you can, or really really do your research and ask questions and actually what we ended up doing was asking the agent for contact details of customers that had been with them before and phoning the phoning them up or messaging them and asking them and then everyone that we asked who had been with our agent was more than happy to answer questions and, and and give us advice because at the end of the day a lot of these trips regardless how much money they cost for people they're an expense but more than that you're in a a foreign country you don't know the customs and the cultures and it's always nice to go go prepared you're going to learn things on the way and make mistakes and things like that but what's what do they say pre prepared is pre-warned or or something like that anyway yeah yeah go prepared preparation prevents piss poor performance or something yeah prior preparation (laughs) prevents piss poor performance there you go The, the perfect one so that's what that's what it was and yeah a few days in the hotel and then the sort of final stint the only hurdle that I came across I took the new the new Merkel out which I loved just for the record best bit of kit I've got Sally Sauer who I which is my other rifle but she's not been out of the she's not been out of the cabinet since I've had this new Merkel and I absolutely why did you like Angela it. so much I just Angela. think everybody said to me because prior to that everybody was saying to me that you should have a synthetic stock because of the places that I'm going it's going to get bashed and the sour has got beautiful wood it's it's had a London finish on it and I've done way too much with it that I you know to make it look special and actually you're frightened of damaging it and the and the Merkel is a real workhorse it's beautiful so so cool and so easy to shoot and the speed of it is phenomenal so I like that uh, especially in my instance here where I needed to get a second, you know, I wanted to get a quick second shot off. It was awesome for that. But with regards to the synthetic stock, it was fantastic. I just, I just genuinely loved it. And actually I find myself, it's just, a, it's, the action is just cool. And I just like, I just like taking it out and shooting that a lot more now. So yeah, with, so going back from uh, the hotel to, through, through to the airport, I had everything prepared, all my paperwork. And I knew my paperwork was meticulous because I checked it twice and the agent had checked it. And there was no issue with it coming in. When I was leaving, and this is something that people should be wary of, I got stopped at the border uh, at the customs and they said, you've not got the paperwork for your rifle to go back. And I said, yeah, I have. There's the paperwork. I've paid for it. Hit this and the other. And at this point, he started showing me a screen. This was the airline showing me a screen 
which made no sense to me whatsoever. And this is why I think it's also really important that you go with a good agent and somebody that will support you and be able to translate and represent you and fight your corner. So I showed the paperwork and they said, no, no, you've not paid it. And at this point, I, I, I didn't feel in a position or comfortable enough to argue. I just I said, pay however much it is, it's $140, however much it is, there's my card, take it off. And he goes, no, no, we want cash. I was like, I bet you, I, I bet you do. I bet you yeah. do. And I'm in no position at this point to argue. So I go and get cash out. It actually ends up swallowing my card. So I, get to have, I had to order a new card. Yeah. And I pay this guy cash, but I get him to, to do me a receipt. And that was the first and only hurdle that we had to deal with. It wasn't, it was, it was just somebody who worked for the airline who saw me coming and tried, tried to look with it. I gave in because I wasn't, I just wanted to get home. And at this point, I just got on the plane and went. I actually raised a complaint with the airline, had proof. They had no re- record of the payment whatsoever when I got back. But thankfully, I had proof. And a long story short, they ended up paying me, paying me, refunding me the money because I could prove that it was. So that was the only, only issue. But the agent was translating and explaining things for me. And she was absolutely fantastic. Yeah, go with an agent. What was the name of the agent that you went with? She's got uh, Anastasia. She's actually, I'll, I'll, what, we, what we can do is we can put the details in at a later day because she's m- moving from um, one, a- one area to another. So she's sending me all her new, new paperwork over soon. Absolutely fantastic. So lovely. So much fun. So organised with the paperwork. And I've already, uh, I've been on the phone to her today actually to organise another trip back to Kyrgyzstan next year. And I think we're going to do Kazakhstan with her as well in 2024. Oh, amazing. And what, what are you going to be after? We're in talks about going doing what they call um, morale, which are like basically for, uh, they're like a giant red deer. And I mean, they're a giant. But again, <laughs> I'm more interested in going, going to this place because of the scenery and, and the actual hunt, not necessarily pulling the trigger because it's such a small part of the whole trip. And I just want to hunt in as many different countries and meet as many different people as possible because I've learned so much from them like the guides their experience their knowledge the places and the things that they've seen and they were showing you things on them on their mobiles like walking around the corner of a cliff and three snow leopards go up David Attenborough hasn't even got that footage (laughs) whilst I lay there at night on many occasion on the over that of that of the 10 days I was there going why the hell am I here Every morning I'd wake up to the most beautiful views. I spent it with one of my closest friends who has become even closer whilst we're hunting. You know, from you spend 10 days with somebody in the same room, you <laughs> you get from put music on while I go to the toilet to, <laughs> oh, I'm just going to the toilet. <laughs> you just, <you've, laughs> all, all your, you know, you shed all your inhibitions. You just go, oh, do you know what? To meeting some amazing people and understanding different communities, people who live in the middle of nowhere. And you just think, they, you think they're so happy there. And yet I'm poles apart in my world. And yet if I took them out in Manchester, they'd be so, they'd be the same as me. <laughs> what the <laughs> hell am I doing here? <laughs> so it was, it was an incredible experience, a, a true emotional roller coaster. A few bruised egos from coming up and down mountains on cliffs and sharp rocks. A couple of sore heads. And four litres of vodka. And four litres of vodka. That, you know, that was, that was, that was between probably, probably eight of us. I, I'm, that might be an exaggeration on eight. It might have been six. <laughs> but, um, you know, just, amazing experience like that for a first first time hunting aboard where i traveled with I've traveled with guns um and where english isn't people's first language or remotely there you know a language that they're, they're particularly used to but yet you stumble across and actually you learn from these people you can communicate through gestures with hunting that, that, are, big, that are sort of universal and it's amazing really how many you know terms or gestures become synonymous with hunting and things like that so yeah amazing absolutely amazing a phenomenal experience and for anyone listening how much um as a kind of ballpark figure how much do people need to set aside for say a 10-day excursion to Kyrgyzstan would you say I would say something for 10 days in Kyrgyzstan I would sort of be looking at around you'd be looking about seven and a half maybe eight thousand 
And that I, you could probably genuinely get your flights in with that as well. Now it's a big, big chunk of money, and it you know it's a you know a year or two's worth of saving, you know, in my instance in the, for, for this for this one. But I look at it now and I go, well, I've had ten days in a country that is off so many people's radio radars. Nobody, not many people knew it existed. I've spent it with great company, eating some really interesting, great food, seeing some bizarre sights from. Cows, you know, queuing queuing in traffic with cows, <laughs> and dogs running down the street with uh, with, with uh, KFC buckets in the city centre, to very interesting toilet toilets in the service station, to stunning scenery, incredible animals, amazing people with real knowledge and um, passion for what they do, and memories made for life. And you think, yeah, it's seven and a half grand, eight grand, whatever it is. And yet I compare that having shot a lot of pheasant shooting and done a lot of pheasant shooting in the UK, and I love it still, but it becomes too too much of a muchness for me. You know, you do the same thing and you say, you know, if you shoot the same shoot, for me, that's not what it is about anymore. I go to, I go pheasant shooting to see friends that all work the dog. I go hunting for memories and experience, or experiences rather, and actually to gain experience because I'm still relatively new to it. I just want to want to want to gain my experience through slightly less conventional ways than others. It just it sounds like you had an absolutely phenomenal adventure. And I would love to talk to you about your next one in the next episode. And can you give me an idea of what we will be talking about in the next instalment? The next inst- instalment will be my second trip this will be my second trip but we can also talk about the first tri- the first time to Norway where I spent it with two guys who have become very good friends of mine hunting moose drinking more local home brews I think that's going to be a, that's going to be a thread try, uh, through this through this podcast home brews and hunting but that's perfect <laughs> that, yeah that, there's the tagline so yeah, we've done vodka in Kyrgyzstan. Next time it'll be moose and Korsk, I think it, I think it was pronounced, which I learned this time round. And I think that was strong coffee with 86%. It was 86% it, this one was, and they said that it's still not strong enough. You could set it on fire. So yeah, we'll be talking about moose hunting in sort of mid-north Norway. And we'll talk about the two trips that I've done there so far. One successful, one unsuccessful in the in the sense of I didn't we didn't shoot a moose but still successful in that you're out with great people, seeing things that most other people haven't had the fortune yet to do. Yeah, so we'll talk about we'll talk about uh, Norway, uh, Norwegian moose. Awesome, I can't wait. Well, thank you very, very much. much. And um, I will speak to you again very soon. Thanks very much. Thank you for listening. And if you like this episode, Don't forget to subscribe on Podbean for more and visit vikingshoot.com for more details about Viking arms, Merkel rifles and Leopold optics.